that was incompatible with God. That man was killed on the cross. The reality of the fact in Christianity is we are born of the Spirit, but we are discipled by the Word. Welcome, Welcome to, to Jubilee, Jubilee Christian, Christian Church, Church Thicker Road. Understand that there is a capacity that is called the nature of God that is in you. We, we preach Christ. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin. It says there are certain things that the Bible is telling us how they entered. And the Bible says that they entered through one man. Re realize this. It doesn't say they entered through Eve. It doesn't say it entered through the woman. It says it entered through the man. Why? Because the responsibility had been given to the man. All right? The responsibility and headship and leadership had been given to the man. So the Bible says that sin entered through that one man and death through sin. And thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Okay? For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed. That's a word I will discuss later. Sin is not imputed where there is no law. He says, if there is no law, there is no imputation of sin. But as long as there is a law, there will be an imputation of sin. And this tells us why Jesus had to bring an end to the law. All right? It tells us why Christ had to bring an end to the law. Because as long as there was a law against God's people, there had to be an imputation of sin. And we'll look at it later, as I said. And the Bible says, uh, Nevertheless, death reigned through Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. This one is giving us a, a very interesting principle. I'll just lay the foundation before I get into the meat of it. It says, even those who did not eat the fruit, all right, and they were born, they were born with the sin of Adam. Are you getting me? So that's very important. So you don't have to say that you are not in Eden. You don't have to say that you did not eat the fruit. All right? The Bible says everybody who was born, by virtue of Adam's disobedience, all of us became sinners. And that is very important because it also tells us that even though you are not punished the way Jesus was punished, executed the way he was executed, crucified the way he was crucified, or died the death with which he died, yeah? even though you didn't go through all that, you have received his righteousness. You understand? So one man sinned and we became heirs of his uh, uh, condemnation. One man obeyed God and we have become partakers and recipients of his righteousness. Are you hearing me? So that's very, very important for us to note. So that's what he's telling us. And it's going to be important for what I am talking about. So he's saying that even though oh yeah, you have not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, we have become sinners. Amen. Who is a type of him who was to come? Verse 15. The free gift is not like the offense. 
For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to how many? To many. Praise God. It's abounded to many. Realize last week I talked about why it talks about many and not all. Okay? And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. All right, one sin attracted condemnation, but the Bible says there are many offenses, our failures, our faults, our transgressions. But the Bible says that when you received the gift through Jesus Christ, okay, by faith in Jesus Christ, you received what is called justification. Amen. For if by the one man's offense, Death reigned through the one. Much more, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Again, I said that righteousness could not be given without grace. Anything we receive from God free of charge, without paying or earning it, we receive it solely and purely by the grace of God. Hallelujah. So for us to receive righteousness, righteousness had to be given to us, not on the basis of merit, not on the basis of what we could do, not on the basis of how much we can work for it and earn it. It had to be given on the basis of grace. Somebody say grace. And that is very, very important because when you start to measure merit, when you start to measure work, when you start to measure how people can earn, various people will earn different levels of righteousness. All right? Because in performance, people are not the same. People are not the same in what they can do. Even in working for righteousness, then that righteousness can only be are uh, uh, measured according to what they can earn. But so that all of us can receive the same righteousness, so that even those who cannot work for it, yeah, they don't have a basis to present on which they can receive that righteousness because they cannot work for it, then it means that when you come on the basis of grace and receive it freely as a gift on the basis of grace, you receive the same righteousness without variations. So none of us has more than the other. Because on what criteria would God give you more than your neighbor? How would God give you more than the other person? Praise God. So we have received the same righteousness. Somebody say, I'm the righteousness of God. In Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. You getting me? Therefore, as through one month's offense, judgment came to all men, okay, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through what? Through righteousness to eternal life. So this one gives us the reason why God had to give us grace and righteousness together. is because grace only reigns through righteousness. Okay? And that's what I'm going to talk about. Father, in the name of Jesus, behold, I stand before your people, opening my, word, my mouth to speak your word. I pray that it shall impart grace to those who hear it. 
And I pray that it shall bring forth understanding, comprehension, and knowledge. I speak revelation. Holy Spirit, I rebuke sickness. I rebuke infirmity. You are the healing spirit. Whoever is in this house and those who are watching us and they are ailing right now, I speak healing. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for revelation and thank you for your help. In Jesus' name. Somebody shout and say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, after the fall, and you must understand and you must remember that the, the fall brought what we call spiritual death. All right? If you eat of this fruit, you shall die. Did they die? They died, but they did not die physically. They died what is called spiritual death. What is spiritual death? Spiritual death is separation from God. Being without fellowship and relationship with God is what is called spiritual death. The Bible says that state of sin and transgression is called death. The Bible says when we were dead in our trespasses. Okay? So that came because of the disobedience of Adam and is what is called in many references and in books as the fall. All right? So after the fall, that is the spiritual death I'm talking about, humanity's restoration lay only in God's redemption and salvation. Meaning me and you could not be restored to where God had, uh, had placed us or had placed Adam without God's plan of redemption and God's plan of salvation. Therefore, humanity's great need could only be satisfied and be met by receiving eternal life. The answer to death would be life. Are you getting me? For them to receive, to be taken from the place of spiritual death, all right? The process of their restoration had to involve a process of them receiving what is called spiritual life. And that spiritual life is the one that we call eternal life, everlasting life. is the one we refer to as Zoe. Praise the name of Jesus. So this process could not leave out some very, very important things. For it to qualify to be redemption or to be salvation, for it to do whatever God wanted it to do in our lives, it had to include certain things. And one of those things that it had to include is that salvation or redemption must have life, must bring life, must take us from the dead into life, from darkness into light. Praise God. And that is why when you're talking about redemption in the Bible, he talks about some of these things. He's saying that you, you have come, uh, you may have delivered from the dominion, control, and influence of darkness, and you have been transferred into the kingdom of his dear son. That is the kingdom of light. That once you were darkness, but now you are what? Somebody say, I am light. Are you a part of the darkness? No, you are light. So it had to have light. It, it cannot, you cannot have a salvation or a redemption which has darkness. All right? Or a salvation or redemption which had death. Or a salvation or redemption that still left within me and you the sinful nature. If it was really salvation, and if it was really redemption, it had to deal with the sin nature. Are you following me? For it to qualify to be what is called eternal redemption. Praise God. So it had to have eternal life. And we know eternal life is the nature of God. The attributes, the qualities of God within us. Praise the name of Jesus, just like righteousness is. So it had to bring into us, yeah, those attributes of God. Hallelujah. Now, however, God cannot give or, give or impart his nature to a man or to a woman, yeah, and give them the privilege of his sons to be heirs or heirs together with Jesus Christ or give them the benefit of being the children of God 
except on legal grounds. So God cannot just snatch you eh, and call you my son and give you inheritance. By the time he's snatching you, there's got to be something he does so that your position as his son and your inheritance becomes illegal, becomes unquestionable. It cannot be contested. Are you hearing me? Why? So that because it is illegal, you can defend it. You can defend, you can provide evidence of it. You can provi pro provide a proof of it. Are you hearing me? And that is why the Bible says that faith is our title deed. If you have a car and you ask, where is your proof that this is your car? You provide a logbook. Okay? Where, when you are in the spirit and you ask, where is the proof that you are a child of God? You present your faith in Christ. <laughs> I'm a believer. Somebody tell your neighbor, I'm a believer. So when you say I'm a believer, it means more than just a statement. We have been delivered from cliche Christianity. It's not a, Christi it's not a cliche. It's my title deed. It's my evidence that now I am an heir. That now I'm a child of God. I am not imposing myself in God's family. I have been born into God's family. And the proof of it is my faith. <laughs> somebody say have faith and that faith is not yours so he makes him a son and gives him his own faith as a gift so your evidence Minister Peter that you are a child of God is not in a long argument or a physical document or a baptismal card no 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 your evidence is as spiritual as your sonship. Can you imagine having a physical plot, but having a spiritual title deed? No, no, no. A physical plot requires a physical title deed. A physical car requires a physical logbook. Now, spiritual life. Spiritual inheritance required spiritual evidence. Amen. Hallelujah. And he gave it to you. Somebody say, I have faith. Amen. So it had to be legal. So I am legally a child of God. I am legally seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. Praise God. So you have been made a legal partner. A legal co-worker. There is nothing you are doing as a child of God that is magendo. The basis of your prayer is legal. When you lay your hands on the sick and rebuke them, you are not imposing yourself. You are not impersonating. You know, there are those guys who put police uniform and they are not police. And they try to do what police do. That is impersonation. Are you getting? So you, you are not pretending to be a kingdom person doing what kingdom people are supposed to do. No, you are a bona fide, authentic, genuine kingdom citizen, child of God with the proof that you've been born again. That you've been born of the spirit. Somebody shout and say, I'm a child of God. And I'm telling you this because this is what the devil respects. It does not respect the volume of our voice. It does not even re respect as, you know, just come in there and, and bring long prayers. You ask the sons of Sceva. They came because their father was a priest and started to cast out a devil. And their lives were never the same again. Are you hearing me? They were never the same again because they went to cast out a devil and the devil taught them some dynamics of legality. He says, uh, the devil said to them, Jesus, I know, I recognize, and I acknowledge. Paul, I know, I recognize, and I, I acknowledge. But who are you? You are not in my database. You are not in my service. <laughs> Hallelujah. Who are you? 
All right. So God delivers you into the kingdom of his son and enters you into his database. You are existing right there in his server. Praise God. So that when you call in the name of Jesus, there is a tick. That person is, is in the database. He's in God's body. That one is a genuine son. That one can cast out devils. That one is bona fide. That one is born of the spirit. That one has the evidence. That one can lay their hands on the sick and the sick can recover. That one can inherit the son of God. Why? Because they have faith. So therefore, it would be illegal for God to make a slave of sin who has the nature of sin or the nature of Satan to make him his son. Are you getting me? It would be illegal for God to take a slave of sin, a captive of Satan and put in them his life. Are you still following me? So a man had to come who knew no sin, who was not under the captive of Satan, who was not of the nature of sin, who was not of, of the devil. The Bible says you are of your father the devil because now they became like they became the children of, the, of Satan. They are called the children of God's wrath. A man came who had not known sin. One who had never disobeyed God, uh, God. Praise God. And when he came, there was full legality. And the devil tempted him with the same temptation. He told Adam, uh, he told Eve, take and eat. Told Jesus, take and eat. But this time, Jesus was ready. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds into the, uh, from the mouth of God. And the Bible says three temptations and Satan left him. He had lost the battle of appetites. He had lost appetite for power and glory, appetite for bread. Praise God. He had lost it and he had to leave the son of man. He had to leave the son of God, the only begotten of the father who knew no sin. And therefore for me and you to be delivered, we had to be delivered by a person who had the legality to represent us. How are you representing us? I am representing them as a man. I'm representing them as one of their kind, but not in the same yoke. One of their kind, but not in the same slavery. One of their kind, but not captive to what they are captive to. And that is how he could fit to represent me. An angel could not represent me. Oh, I say it again. An angel could not represent me. He's a man, flesh of our flesh. A man who knew what it means to be tried and to be tempted. A man like us. He had to be our mediator. He had to be our substitute. And that is how legality was fulfilled. Yes, it is legal for a man to take the place of his fellow man. It is legal for a brother to take the place of his his brother because in then in the old testament we had situations like that the philistines stood in the valley of elah and he said choose one man to come and fight for me oh israel are you cowards can't you get one man who can stand against me and if they defeat me we become your servants if we defeat you you become our servants forever and they did not find anybody for 30 days days and nights they were mocked and defied they were insulted by that champion of God called uh, Goliath until a shepherd boy who had come from the backside of the desert. His name is David, the son of Jesse. A man who had had an encounter with God. A man who life had put them in a disadvantaged position. He comes and he hears the insults of Goliath. He hears what he is saying. And he goes to the commanders and he said, Guys, I can deal with this uncircumcised Philistine. I can sort him out. He said, You have never been to war. You have never been to an army. You don't have the credentials. And he said, You are wrong as far as that is concerned. I have credentials. 
but not your kind of credentials. He said to Saul, King Saul, I was taking care of my father's sheep. And a lion came and I slew the lion. And a bear came and I slew the bear. And I don't think God is going to let me down this time around. What I did to the lion, I'm going to do to this Philistine. What I did to the bear, I'm going to do to this Philistine. And they tried to give him the armor. And he said, I don't know how to fight with this kind of thing. My battle has been poured for days differently i'm gonna know i'm going to go the way i know how if you have grown up uh, knowing god through scripture and experiencing god through prayer and your uh, fasting and worship don't allow anything to change your weapons uh, now that you are blessed you can't change your weapon you are here because you prayed you are here because you served you are here because of the things that you did and became your weapons uh, now that you are here don't get smarter don't take the mass of other people stick to your weapon somebody shout and say amen. amen David said I've never fought this way and some of you are frustrated now because you are trying to change strategy in the midst of a battle you've gotten up to halfway and now you're starting to change how you operate and the things that God taught you, when you are right down on the floor, he was teaching you so that it will be a life lesson. So it will take you all the way. That is why even after David became king, he still inquired of the Lord. He did not say that I have armies now. I can afford chariots now. I can buy as many spears now. No, no, no. He still inquired. He still asks God, praise the name of Jesus. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. And it doesn't mean that if you don't trust in chariots, you don't have chariots. You know you can have money and not trust in money. You can have cars and not trust in cars. You can have health insurance, but your trust is not in health insurance. Your trust is in the Lord, your God. You can have an electric fence, but the electric fence is like a size of rope. You don't put your trust in it. Your trust is in the Lord. And I'm going to put it right there. It's not in the notes. But we need to go back to an old-fashioned trust in God. There is nothing God ever gives us so that we can stop believing in him. Never, never, never. He will never bless you with something so that you can stop trusting in him. Trusting in God is a lifetime thing. So the only begotten of God comes the same way and stands and says, this cannot fight. This battle is too strong for them. They don't even know this enemy. They don't know what they've been grappling with. They don't know what it is that has taken over their lives. But he who knows all things steps into the hill of Calvary. David was in the valley, but Jesus was on a mountain. He grabs the cross and carries it to Mount Calvary. And there he wins a battle for all humanity. He disarmed the principality for me. He made a public spectacle for me. And I lean on his victories. I don't stand on what I can do. I stand on the platform of the victories of Jesus Christ. I came to understand that if it could be won by fasting, it would have been won in the Old Testament. If it could be won by the blood of the bulls, it could be won in the Old Testament. If it could be won by a sacrifice of money, it could be that had been sorted by Solomon. He was the wealthiest man. They've never been able to calculate his wealth. But because none of it could set a man free. Who is he that can pay the ransom of his friend? Who can deliver and restore his own soul? By virtue of what he can do. There is no one. So there is only one price. And only one man could pay that price. Only one man qualified to pay that price. This man had never sinned. This man had never been under 
under a yoke. This man had never been under a curse. This man had never disobeyed the father. He had nothing the devil had in him. He said, behold, the ruler of this world cometh, but he has nothing in me. There is nothing he can claim as to belong to him. He is the one in his purity and in his righteousness. He stepped into my place and he said, I will pay the price for them. And he took your sin and my sin and became the curse that we had born. And he died on that cross. He disarmed principality. He canceled every handwriting that was ever against me. And he destroyed the record of it. So now there is no record of me ever being a sin. He died for me. Somebody shout and say, he died for me. Where can the ransom of men's soul come from? Who can ransom the soul of his friend? And only one was found who could ransom mine and yours. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he did so to the full. He did so com completely. Praise the name of Jesus. Somebody said, Tetelestai. He did it completely, completely. Therefore, in order for God to redeem us, without our contribution, without our ability to work for it, without our ability to earn it, for him to deliver us in an area that we couldn't work for him, we, for it, we couldn't earn it. Amen. God had to deal with the need for our righteousness. Because the thing that sin did, is that it expelled righteousness from the lives of people. Are you hearing me? Meaning God's solution for us had to deal with the question of righteousness. You're right before God. You're right standing before him. Therefore, where I've read in the book of Romans, it shows us how God dealt with the legality. Can you go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 26? I will read this and then go to TPT. It says, he did so to do what? Can you read with me? One to go. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be what? Meaning, that whatever God did, it had to prove that God was just. The righteousness or the justness of God had to be without question. It had to be legal. Are you hearing me? All right. And the justifier of the one who has what? Faith in Christ. Put it in TPT, please. Re and say it. And when the, sa the season of tolerance came to an end, there was only one possible way for God to give away his righteousness and still be true to both his justice and his mercy. So meaning, God wants to show you mercy. But he has to do so in a way that his righteousness is not contradicted. Because he's a righteous God. Are you hearing me? So he drew this plan of salvation where one man who is... Can I tell you? Can I shock you something? Can I shock you? Can I shock you? See what shock comes me, amen. Can I shock you? You know even Satan himself never thought that God could ever become man. He knew God could make a man, create a man, but he never thought that God could ever be a man. And if you look at church history, if there is something that has been fought, left, right, and center, season, I'm a generation after generation, is what is called incarnation. How can the one who said, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, feet in the belly of a virgin. How? How can the one who asked David, which house will you build for me? 
Where can you put for me that I may do it? How? How is that that man, uh, that, that God can come and fit in the womb of a teenager? So the devil thought this thing has totally been sorted. Are you hearing me? He tried to fight because he fought against Moses because he thought the deliverer will be a normal man. But he never thought that the deliverer will be God himself wearing the human suit. Who was Jesus? Those I'm seeing question mark. Who was Jesus? Those are the people who didn't come to church in December. When I was teaching, when God became man. Why God became a man? And for your sake, because I love you, one day I will repeat it. God, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And the word became flesh. Another version says, and the word became human. That was a shock. Even for the devil himself. Hallelujah. The Bible says, let me finish. To offer up his own son. So now, because we stand on the faithfulness of Jesus, God declares us what? Righteous in his eyes. This is what is called imputed righteousness. Praise God. Are you following? So in the Old Testament, he had spoken to Jeremiah through words of prophecy. He said, I'm the Lord thy righteousness. Jehovah Sidkenu. He didn't understand what God really meant when he says, I am Jehovah thy righteousness. He did not understand the entire process and dynamics that involved God being our righteousness. Hallelujah. So God's solution was that man could not be righteous by himself. By his work or by his merit. Therefore, if you cannot earn it, you cannot work for it, you cannot get it by qualification or by merit, then the only way that remains for you to get it is as a gift. Are you following me? So that is why righteousness becomes a gift. Romans 5.17, the gift of righteousness. Somebody said the righteousness of God. And as I demonstrated last Sunday, when the Lord gives you his righteousness, does it become less? Does it become diluted? Does it become less effective? If I give you a jug of water, does it become less water? Please. It remains the same. And I told you the problem with many people is that they think that whenever God gives you something, when it comes into your hands, it loses its value or loses its power or loses its effectiveness. And that is where faith comes in. That you have to believe that if he gave me the Holy Spirit, then he gave me the Holy Spirit the way he gave it to him to Peter, the way he gave him to Paul, the way he gave him to James, the way he has given him through the generations. If he has given you righteousness, which kind of righteousness or what type of righteousness has he given you? His own righteousness. Somebody say, the righteousness of God makes me as righteous as God. Why? No, 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 let me see. <laughs> As you fellowship with him, remember, light and darkness can never have fellowship. So he has given you his righteousness, his own righteousness, so that when you are fellowshipping with him, you are not fellowshipping with him from here. You are fellowshipping with him, same righteousness. 
So he gives you his righteousness. He gives you his spirit. And his spirit does not become weaker in you. Oh God, help this church to understand. The Holy Spirit does not become weaker in you. <laughs> he is the same. You know, you who is sitting there, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that is in you right now is the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Those are thoughts will will keep you awake. Hallelujah. Praise God. So it makes you as righteous as God himself. In fact, we even go deeper. That through what Jesus Christ did, you as a person, somebody say myself, you have become the righteousness of God in Christ. So now, Righteousness is a person. As he is a person. Are you getting me? Righteousness becomes you and me. Somebody say, I am the righteousness, I am the righteousness of, God of God in Christ Jesus. That was the solution. We could only receive righteousness as a gift. You know, there are people in 2023, there are people who still believe that their good works can earn them salvation. And this Bible has been in print for thousands of years. Are you getting the word? The word has been there. Are you getting me? So here we are told that you can only receive it as a gift. But what is the basis of you receiving that gift? Remember I said that God cannot take his nature and put his nature in a man of sin. In the nature of sin. And mix his nature with darkness. Okay? So for you to receive that righteousness... Something has to change in you. In fact, let me put it another way. You had to change. How did you change? You had to be crucified. Therefore, the Bible says one man died, therefore all. Somebody say, I died with Christ. Is this too heavy for you? Honey, am I doing okay? One man died, all died. So you had to be killed. You had to die while sins could be forgiven. The nature could only be crucified. Amen. Hallelujah. So I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives. But Christ lives in me. Then you are buried together with Christ. Then you are raised together with Christ. Praise the name of Jesus. This man is dead in trespasses. God had the power to just come and say, come back to life. And we all come back to life. He is God and he will do that with the last trumpet. You remember? We are waiting for that last trumpet. Are you waiting for it? The Bible says with that last trumpet, the dead in Christ shall rise up first. And all of us that remain shall be caught up in the air. God had the power to do that. He gave that in, you know, suggestion or he, he gave that, uh, you know, to Ezekiel. He says, can these bones live? So God has the ability to declare all of us alive and we became alive. But God had to declare spiritually dead men and children of wrath with the nature of sin and slaves of darkness. He had to put away, I mean, in place a system that he could legally give them life and declare them righteous. And that entire process I'm talking about is what is called the sufferings, the death or the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Are you hearing me? So, this Messiah couldn't save without his death. Couldn't save without his burial. Couldn't save without his resurrection. So every step of it is a fulfillment of what was required for you to be free and to, for you to be declared the righteousness of God in Christ. Thank you. So man, me and you, needed righteousness on three folds. All right? Man's sins, take the keys, who's there? Jose. Man's sin and transgression could not be overlooked. Listen, please. You could never condone sin. And this is what me or other preachers of grace have been accused of. That we encourage people to sin. That our message encourages people to sin and we condone sin. There is no time that God ever condones sin. Never. Even under the law. He never condones sin. In fact, the more they were reminded of their sin, the more they sinned. The Bible tells us this, that we become what we see. If you see the sinner version of you, what do you become? The sinner. But if you see the righteousness of God, it says, beholding as in a mirror, we are being changed into the same likeness even by the Spirit of God, from one level of glory to another. And that is why we labor to present to you a picture of who you are as the righteousness of God. Alright? Nobody needs to be shown their picture as a sinner. You know more than we know. You know where God picked you from. Hallelujah. Yeah. You know, you know where God is. So nobody needs to stand here every Sunday and remind, where are you going? No, no, no. Where are you going? My work is to tell you there is one who suffered to make you different. And he has made you a new creation by his death and by his resurrection. And my assignment is to make that picture plain, plain that you can rise up and when people look at who you used to be and who you are now, they cannot reconcile the two. Why? Because you have gotten a glimpse of who you are in God's mind. Not in people's mind. Not in the minds of religion. Religion is what keeps on counting. God forgives and forgets. The amens are few. How many of you would like God to remember your sin? Oh. Unataka akumbuke. No one. You are the one who remembers. Your sins, he will remember no more. Are you getting? Now, sin could never be overlooked, condoned. The Bible says every sin requires a just retribution. So every one of our sin was punished in Jesus Christ. Praise God. Number two, although God is almighty and all powerful, his victory over Satan had to be on the grounds of undeniable justice or righteousness. You know what I'm saying? The devil sinned in heaven, isn't it? And he was kicked out of heaven without death and the resurrection of Christ. In fact, God never got into the battle. If you read the Bible, you will see that God never gets into war with Satan. It's angels. Even in, in Revelation, God is not going to be the one who to deal with Satan. It's the angel who tied him up. Are you getting? Yeah. That tells us how mighty our God is. The issue of dealing with Satan once and for all will be a delegated matter. Are you getting? So when he comes here on the earth, why doesn't God just do the same as he did in heaven? In heaven he just kicked him. 
out. I saw, uh, I mean the angel threw him out. I saw Satan fall like the lightning from heaven. Why didn't God do the same and just throw him into the abyss once and for all? Somebody say legality. It's because by deceiving man, he had gotten the legality of he being in charge of the earth. Are you getting? He had received the legality. He says, for the kingdoms of this world have been committed to me. And I give them to whoever I want. Who delivered them to Satan? Is Adam through his disobedience. So God had to come or send his son Jesus Christ to get back the kingdoms of this world legally. And he's doing it through you and through me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Number three. God's actions must be in line with his own righteousness. God had to do all those things and not contravene his righteousness. And that is what he has done. He has made us all priests and kings and he remains righteous. He has delivered us all and made us his righteousness in Christ and he remains righteous. So there are two things and I enclose. Two things. We see two types of righteousness. There's what is called imputed righteousness and there's what is called imparted righteousness. What is to impute? To, be, to impute means, yeah, if you're writing, to be reckoned, to be declared, to be considered, to be counted, as righteous to be assigned as righteous that righteousness is attributed to you even though even though it is not your own are you hearing me so you have one person on this side who has lived his life in disobedience to god all right, but on the act of believing God as Abraham did. Now, imputation of righteousness happened before the cross. It happened for Abraham before the cross. But the impartation of righteousness can never happen before the cross. Are you hearing me? So, he has all those things. And then, he believes God. And when he believes God, he, it is a, his faith. And what he has done is accounted to him as righteousness. So righteousness is assigned to him not because he had it. Are you getting me? But because there is something he has done and that's called faith. And from now on, all the record of his unrighteousness is replaced by record of one act of righteousness. And so the Bible says, through one man's act of righteousness, many have been made righteous. That is imputed. Like a garment is imputed. Is accounted. Praise the name of Jesus. I love your cologne. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, when you go, poof. Hey, amen. What do I say? So, imputed. imputed righteousness. So he can have it on him, but not in him. Are you getting? It's not in him, but it is on him. It's imputed. Hallelujah. But now, when Jesus came and died, he made you a new creation. Your old man is dead. The old sinner is dead. You have become new. What is the state of need this new creation? Is he a new creation with the old nature of unrighteousness? Is he a new creation with the nature of sin? Has God given birth? To a child who has the nature of sin. Is it possible? 
Are you born of God? You are born of God. If you are born of God, then what kind of sons has God given birth to? He has given birth to sons with the nature of righteousness. His own nature. Are you hearing me? So at the new birth, when you are born again as a child of God, you have the, what is called the impartation of righteousness. So you are living life with righteousness imputed and righteousness imparted. Oh my God. That can make us all. Somebody say righteousness imputed and righteousness imparted. Shout and say righteousness on me and righteousness in me. Your sin was imputed on him. He did not commit sin. He knew no sin. But your sin was imputed on him. So he had your sin on him, but he did not have sin in him. Wow. Oh, begin my coffee, please. Are you hearing me? So that his righteousness in him. Oh my God. The righteousness in him was given to you. Now you have it in you. Hallelujah. Now listen. There is no way the righteousness in can become only the righteousness on. Because I began to tell you that spiritual death required spiritual life. Nature requires nature. Law requires law. Imputation requires imputation. Righteousness inside required righteousness inside. I praise the name of this. Sit down, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate them. I'm ready now to finish. Up on the corner. Bring my towel. Bring my anointed towel, please. Are you are taking it as a souvenir or what? <laughs> so we have righteousness in us, and that is whatever you you have in you is what identifies you. It's not what you have on. That is why Abraham could not say he's the righteousness of God. Because he only had imputed righteousness. But when it has become in you, it has become a part of your nature, it becomes your definition. Oh my God. It becomes your definition. Somebody say, I am the righteousness of God. Come on, amen. That makes you the righteousness of God because you have righteousness is is a nature. <laughs> All right. So you're given this nature. I'm going to need you again, son. You're a good example. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, he has righteousness on. He has righteousness in. All right. You can only work out what is in hallelujah so when you are told to work out your own now if you have it inside you it is god's righteousness but it is also yours can you say my righteousness all right you can only work it out. And I said, salvation must include certain things. Life, righteousness, and stuff like that. So what you have in is what you can work out. You can only work out your salvation if you have your salvation inside. Can you, can you work out what you don't have inside? Praise God. And this reason, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing by saying, you're given it in you, not only as a legal standing with God, okay, so that also it becomes the basis of your life. So here on the earth, there are people who believe that you cannot live on the earth without sin. Is it possible? You can. Can you live here on, without sin? You can. 
Okay, let me ask you again. Can you live on the earth without sin? Yes. Why? Because your nature has changed. The struggle where sin comes in, the struggle comes where you have a nature in you, but a mind that is not renewed according to the nature. So you find temptation is of the mind, is of the soul. That's where we have, I think, I will, I feel. You remember? I think intellect. I feel emotions. I will, the will. You understand? Is in the soul. And if that mind is not renewed, you can have a God, the righteousness of God as your nature, but the mind keeps on taking you to do certain things. Praise God. So now, let, let, let me go. So you have that righteousness, and that righteousness has brought you into right standing, alignment, compatibility, and harmony with God. God is spirit. Somebody say, God is spirit. And because he is spirit, you cannot see spirit. Are you getting me? Somebody say, you can't see spirit. Therefore, spirit needs to be seen. Can you say it? Will you flow with me? You can't see spirit, but spirit needs to be seen. How is spirit seen? In the flesh. Beautiful. Are you getting? And that is where we talk about fruits of righteousness. He has a nature within him. And he has righteousness imputed on him. And has, he lives here on the earth. What we see with our eyes is called the fruits of righteousness. So we have become branches that bear, God cannot bear the fruits of righteousness as spirits, as spirit. He can only bear fruits of righteousness through you and me. Thank you. All right. Are you feeling me? So what are fruits of righteousness? There is a relationship based on the righteousness inside us that we have received, then there is a way that we are supposed to behave. Are you hearing me? I said I'm giving you the last revelation. Are you ready for this? The reason why God gives you his righteousness is not that you can just relate with him, but also that he can send you and you represent him and when you are seen, it is his righteousness that is seen. When a government officer makes a mistake, who is seen? Is the government. When a police officer, a KDF officer, makes a mistake, do we see the, K, the, the, the person or do we see the KDF? Do we see the police? So now God gives you his righteousness so that as you walk as his representative, as you walk here as his proxy and as his agent, you are working with his badge. Amen. Are you hearing me? You are casting out devils with his badge. And I'm using a badge because that's what companies give their employees. Are you getting me? So that when you are walking, you say, in the name of Jesus is a badge you have. And that badge has the very nature of God. God doesn't want to be a righteous God represented by unrighteous people to do righteous business. Are you getting? So he wants to be the righteous God represented by people who are his own righteousness to do righteous business. And that business is what we call the kingdom of God, the business of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And that is what is called the fruits of righteousness that you bear by what you are doing on earth for God's sake, for the purpose of God, for representing him. What are you manifesting? Because 
fruits is manifestation. You shall know them by their fruit, by their manifestation, by what they are bringing forth. So your righteousness, your, the fruit of your righteousness is what you're bringing forth. Is your tangible contribution to the kingdom of God. Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower. No, no, wait, wait a minute. What is seed to the sower? Seed in the parable of the sower is word. But here seed is money. He's talking about money. He's talking about giving. All right. He says, now, can we read now? Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of? It has to do with your giving. That teaching of giving goes from chapter 8 into chapter 9. And God is, I mean, uh, Paul is teaching them about the church in Macedonia and then brings it to them to teach them about giving and he's telling them that giving when you are giving it brings the manifestation of the fruits of your righteousness that money is made unjust by how you get it are you getting but no money is made unjust by the purpose you attach to it how do you use it? Are you getting? How do you use it? So that is what makes it unjust. Meaning, the men of this world get their money to enhance wickedness. The Bible says, the increase of the just leads to life, but the gain of the wicked leads to death. He says that if you give a wicked man a lot of money, you are increasing the capacity for him to do more wickedness. Are you getting? But if you bless a righteous man, you are giving that righteous man the ability to do righteous things. Hallelujah. And that is why his money leads to life. Okay? The increase of the wicked leads to death, but the increase of the righteous leads to life. Why? Because of what the righteous will do with his increase. Are you hearing me? Yeah. So, fruit of righteousness has to do with what you do for the kingdom of God. What you do, and God, I told you, God has sent his son to die for us and has given us a kingdom, but he has left it to us to preach this gospel and to build that kingdom, to extend. He says, wherever you go, declare the kingdom of God is here. I am done.